Okay, we're going to call to order the City of Longmont Transportation Advisory Board meeting for January 9th, 2023. Let's do a roll call, please. Taylor Wicklin. Here. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Present. Diane Christ. Present. Chair, you have a quorum. Great, thank you. Um, we were going to approve the minutes of the preceding meeting um, in December of 2022, but we did find there were three things that we want to have changed. The reference to Chairperson McInerney rather than board member. Um, Taylor instead of Tyler. <laughs> and sorry for laughing. And um, also I think there was uh, an addition of uh, a verb in one of the sentences related to the Boulder uh, speed limit question that uh, board member McInerney brought up. So we will move on to uh, communications from staff. Great, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City. I uh, just wanted to let you know that on your desk tonight is a new bike map for 2023. We still have a number of bike maps from last year, so we are going to try to get rid of those um, still. They're still pretty, pretty good, but we think uh, we have these in our hand at the beginning of the year. This is wonderful. This is the way we'd like to do it every year and uh, have them ready for spring when the bike season really kind of takes off and uh, We'll, we'll have them ready then, but we were, are trying to um, kind of distribute what we have out there uh, right now as we can. But uh, if, if you have any questions or comments about the bike map, please let us know. Ben Ortiz put that together. He's in the front row here waving. Um, and so just a thanks for, to Ben for, uh, for getting that, that done in a timely fashion here. We actually uh, were able to pay for it before the end of the year, so that was always a good thing too with budget. Um, other items, um, did you have anything, Jim? I think that's it for our items from staff, but thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Phil. And we'll go ahead and see if there's any public that would like to be heard today. Okay. Um, I believe that our information item for the regional electric vehicle plan She's still delayed in traffic, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Would we like to move then to just the action plan for the proposed work plan uh, in lieu of that? And then we can, when she does arrive, then we can go over her presentation? Perfect, we'll try to stretch this out for you here a little bit. <laughs> sure. But not too much. Okay. So last meeting in December, uh, we did ask you to give us some feedback on the work plan. We did put it in that, that packet, so we appreciate the feedback that we received at the time. We did make those corrections. It doesn't look very pretty right now, but it will once uh, once we get it uh, kind of to the next level of adoption here, once you, um, as a board, uh, consider it, and we'll consider it with any amendments that you might have as well. So it's really broken into a couple different sections here, four sections. Um, the first section being a more of a regional uh, idea of how we work regionally with this, with this group, with the Trans Transportation Advisory Board. So we have the... Um, the countywide projects through Boulder County that is just kind of an ongoing thing. We, we try to bring them in and we can, um, and if you have specific things that you'd like to hear from Boulder County, let us know if you've heard other things that, that are going on. Uh, we can certainly kind of pinpoint those. CDOT, it's the same way. They, they have a bunch of different things going on right now. We're kind of focused on the I-25 and 119 park and ride, which is kind of a big deal for this area, as well as the, um, State Highway 66 over to Maine, that's getting into, that's past the design stage now. So we're getting into the construction phases of that and we're going after some TIP projects for that. You'll see TIP in here, Transportation Improvement Program projects under Dr. Cog. So that's the next one on there. But we, that one really talks about regional transportation plan updates and Vision Zero program updates. So again, ongoing pieces. If you have any, again, specific interest in any of those, we can bring them back individually. We're also doing Vision Zero at the city level, so this might be a good tie-in to bring them in uh, for some of those efforts. But um, kind of missing from here, and we are still working on it, we thought we'd kind of be done in 2022 with a lot of the information for the Transportation Improvement Program projects, but we are in call number four, which is the last call of this four-year cycle, and it is stretching into 2023 here, so we will be back in front of you and I'll just add that in here to make sure that um, we're tracking. 
but we do have some projects that we'll be going for and once we get the applications in we will have more information to you about kind of where we're at as far as applications and scoring and all those good things next one on the list is the flex ridership and service levels we usually do that in quarter number three you saw those most fairly recently so uh, we'll be back in quarter number three of next year to tell talk to you a little bit more about the ridership the service levels and then how much we pay uh, to those to that group to keep that transit service uh, going between Longmont, Berthoud, Loveland, and Fort Collins, as well as there's a trip to Boulder, but we can't really get on that bus. <laughs> We've ta talked about that a little bit. Uh, speaking of RTD, um, <laughs> sort of, uh, we'll be talking to them as well. There's a peak service study that's coming forward. Oh, I should have brought the, uh, as, a, as a staff update, we should have chatted a little bit about some open houses that are coming toward the end of this month and I'll get those to you in a in an email format but at the end of this month they are going to do some open houses one's in gum barrel and then one's in um, I believe it's in Westminster so there's two opportunities to 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 go to those meetings obviously our gum barrel one is probably the most um, proximate to where we are to, uh, for, for for Longmont we did try to get it into Longmont but um, they've, they've kind of segmented it up I'll get those details. I should have those by the end of the meeting too for you to report in pub so more publicly as, as those dates and times um, are, are already out there. So I do want to share that with you. Phil, um, I yes. had a quick question. <clears throat> Excuse me. On that uh, study, do they have a, an idea or a, I should say a desired deadline as to when they're going to have that ready? I believe it's at the end of the year okay. by the time they wrap everything up. I'm just going to go over my calendar really quick and just share those dates with you so you have them um, again in, in more of the public format but let's see yeah so the the first meeting is going to be Tuesday which is great because that's our council typically our council night but uh, Tuesday January 31st starting at um, five o'clock going to seven o'clock at the Hampton Inn and Suites in North, they say North Boulder, but it's uh, 6333 Lookout Road, so that's Gun Barrel. The second meeting is at the Westminster City Park Recreation Center, and that will also start at 5 p.m., end at 7 p.m. on Thursday, the 2nd of February. So folks like uh, who don't live in town. I'll look over at my friend Ben. Uh, that's at the Westminster City Park Recreation Center, 10455 Sheridan Boulevard in Westminster. So again, five to seven. And those are the two public events that we'll have on, or that RTD is going to have on that. That meeting on the 31st, um, there's not a council meeting, and there's an LHA Board of Commissioners meeting. Okay. That works out well for us. <laughs> So no council meeting that night, but it's a Longmont Housing Authority meeting. Um, also with RTD, just the ongoing idea of working with them and getting the, IG, the intergovernmental agreement going and ready for First and Main, the transit station that we've been talking about for years and years, and finally getting to the next stage in that uh, with also the TOD, the Transit Oriented Development Planning and Construction, and the uh, We Can Cross Off Infrastructure Master Plan that has been completed. So that's good. Uh, we always are talking about the bus rapid transit project along Colorado State Highway 119 as well. That's an ongoing project and you'll um, see more coming out of that as we move forward into uh, higher levels of design and getting into construction on that. There's some exciting news there. We'll share, with, we'll share that with you. Um, maybe uh, have them come in and share some of that news that they are getting funding for that project. So it is starting to piecemeal the funding together very slowly and surely, but they are getting funding, uh, federal funding for that um, at different levels. Then also in quarter number two, we, um, we'll probably bring them forward with the, uh, well, this is gonna be more of a uh, Boulder County option or, or piece. We say RTD, it was RTD, and now it's kind of shifted into Boulder County, so I'm gonna have to move that one. Um, the 287 BRT study, that's turned into more of a Vision Zero uh, safety study at this point. So they've got the routes where the bus rapid transit needs to go on that corridor and then Boulder County is now taking over the piece of safety along that corridor. 
So we'll want to move that move that for you in the next iteration of this uh, schedule. Uh, but we'll be back. Uh, those will have public outreach events as well. So um, we'll bring it to TAB as well as share the public, those public outreach events uh, with you and the citizens. Uh, we also talked about uh, quarter number two. We always have RTD come and the whole staff comes and you get the uh, almost the two hour download from uh, RTD about what's going on, kind of the state of the system uh, report from them. So that'll be coming typically in April is when we do that, but we'll see how that goes. And then just continually ongoing, the evaluate the, the system and potential improvements for local, regional, call and ride service, review that ridership data, uh, just to make sure we're on track with that ridership. Usually that's given to us in that quarter two analysis as well. So that's what we're doing regionally. Is there anything that I, that's been left off by staff that you would uh, like to see added as a regional effort? We think we've covered them all. There's probably a Weld County piece here that's might be interesting as far as we do do, we do do. We do tip projects into um, in, in the Weld County group as well. So there's a sub-regional Boulder County and there's a sub-regional Weld County. So maybe one of the things that uh, you would wanna see is Weld County, a little bit more involvement with that as we, uh, we're involved with them quite a bit. Any comments on that first section? Okay, Phil, um, are they going to review the bus routes in Longmont? Uh, Chair Lehner and, and uh, Board Member Chris, they are going to, they've actually done a review and I believe we heard this in April where they outlined the basic uh, new routes that they're gonna add to Longmont in the local bus system. So that's really meant to tie in with the first and main opening. And uh, we, so we probably won't see those actually become active until first and main is open, which we're hoping is by 2025 or in 2025. So it's, it's still a ways out there. Two years now, so we're getting a little closer, but um, that's the planned implementation timeline. I, I know one of the pieces of feedback we received in the uh, last um, public outreach that we did, I think that was in November, uh, Mayor Peck was very uh, enth enthusiastically encouraging people to ride buses and there was concern that a lot of times the buses don't go where people need to ride them to. So so I just wondered if there's gonna be any, any additional service before 2025 on buses. Well, and, and RTD has indicated that they were they will they are working toward that end but it's going to be mostly on the regional system so it'd be between here and denver's where you'll see the increase in in buses if there's any the local system will wait they will wait on that until first domain is complete yeah okay Thanks, and open Phil. so for the next section we really focus more on our planning efforts the envision longmont and the what we were calling the Multimodal Transportation implement, Implementation Plan. This year we're moving forward with what's called the TMP or the Transportation Mobility Plan. So that's gonna be an update to that section of Envision Longmont, which is the comprehensive plan for the city. And so this element will be the transportation focus and we hope to start going out for bids and proposals uh, first quarter of this year, end of the first quarter of this year. And uh, once we're done with all the transportation improvement program applications in January, our plan is to move into, into February with the re request for proposals for that. And you'll see there that it's transportation mobility plan for first quarter, and it really is to update that whole transportation section and put a lot of the, uh, we had called them enhanced multi-use corridor, EMUX, that plan, the, the uh, Main Street corridor master planning process, that plan, the roadway master plan, put them all into one effort and really coordinate it all. 
and try to come up with uh, priority prioritizing the actual projects that need to go into the capital improvement program, which is the next thing on the list. Um, we'll certainly take comprehensive plan and land use amendments to you as well. And again, again, the enhanced multimodal plan incorporates with that TMP piece. So we've, we've outlined that here to kind of be more clear about that. The capital improvement program, that's more um, in Jim's world of uh, actually building things. So um, it's good to have the engineers come in and do that annual review with you. And so we will bring that to, in quarter two with the candidate projects for the capital improvement program and then give you an idea of what the current 2023 CIP projects are. So you can kind of see what is out there for upcoming projects and give you a chance to weigh in on what you'd like to see for capital improvement projects for the next uh, round of that. Anything that I missed there? Yep. And uh, so you'll see the busway, Kaufman Street busway on there, um, other studies, bicycle pedestrian elements of the CIP. So those all be reviewed as, as needed. Uh, the other piece is the other piece. Other, uh, basically working on your TAB work plan we're doing that now. We'll also do that in the fourth quarter. We'll do the annual report again, like we did in December. And those are just kind of the, uh, those are just things we cycle in. Uh, the 2023 budget for first quarter that we really need to start talking about those budget items so that you can weigh in on some of that as well. Um, that's, that's different than the CIP portion of the budget. So we'll do operations and transportation system management pieces yeah. with that. Um, Bicycle code, not sure really what that is, but that's always us talking about the different laws that are out there. What we really want to do this year is get some information to folks about the new stop law that's out there so we can get that to the drivers as well as the bicyclists because uh, we want people to understand what the laws are out there. One idea is that we uh, um, work with our communications team and get that out there more of the billing statements and those kind of things so that we can uh, help people understand what's going on with that. Grant funding, obviously, we always are looking at those different things and take those to you as we, as we get them. One grant opportunity that's coming up very soon, and we'll talk more about this, is uh, we've got a, we're gonna go for the RAISE grant again. I can't tell you what RAISE stands for, but it's a great acronym. I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> that uh, it, it really is, it was originally, Tiger, then it was build, and then it was raise. So every new administration renames it, but it's all the same dollars, federal dollars for larger projects. We're looking for $25 million to help us with the 119 and Hover intersection, as well as some other elements of the Colorado 119 bikeway. So you'll see underpasses on there, as well as the underpass we have planned at Hover and 119. Um, crash report. Quarter number three, hopefully this time. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we're hoping that the data uh, um, is, is cleaner and we can get it, it's more easier, easily accessed than this, this last year. Uh, quiet zones, we'll certainly wanna update you on that. And if you have any questions about that, let us know. Uh, traffic safety fund, um, that's our, our program of where we, the, the tickets all have a, surcharge on them. Every uh, moving violation has a ticket or has a, has a cost to it that goes into the traffic safety fund. So we'll want to talk to you about where those dollars should go and how we should spend those. Um, then your annual meeting is always now the, the first meeting in July so that you can vote for your uh, chair, vice chair, because that's when you do your, that's when we have new appointments to the board is in July. So we're off schedule a little bit. We'll also do our annual meeting and we'll talk about the posting of, uh, of where your posting is. Raise grant, definition, rebuilding American, American infrastructure with sustainability and equity. So um, there you go. Um, city design standards, we're actually working on those this year. So you'll see some information on that in, in one way or another. Um, the overall citywide bike and pedestrian plan, that's gonna be incorporated into the TMP as well. Um, same frame, greenway updates. 
we just want to keep you apprised of the closures and detours, especially as we start to build on the uh, or start construction on the Boston Avenue bridge over the over the St. Vrain, which is should be happening later this year, earlier early this yes. year. <laughs> and so we'll we'll just need to keep you keep everybody apprised of what's going on there. Uh, the sugar mill and steam project, uh, that one's almost done actually. So we may bring a final report to you on that, uh, hopefully next month or the month after. EV infrastructure, so uh, electric vehicles, would like to talk a little bit about that tonight. So that's a great, probably segue into that, but we'll we'll still need you to make a recommendation on this on this list. Uh, congestion benchmarks are pretty much outdated at this point. We don't really talk about them anymore, so we need to kind of come up with a different way of looking at. That was one way to to stall growth, I guess, or stop growth if the congestion from a, a project was so much that it kind of blew up, blew up, um, affected an intersection so much that it couldn't operate efficiently. So we would measure and we'd use the benchmarks to stop stop development if we needed to. And that's only happened once since I've been here in 23 years. Um, the local micro transit model and Vision Zero, we'll bring those to you at the end of the year. Uh, Vision Zero, just because we need to start working with the action plan. Once we get the transportation mass mobility plan, excuse me, moving, uh, then we'll start going into the idea of trying to develop an action plan for Vision Zero at that point. And local micro transit model is really looking at different ways in the private sector to uh, provide transit to our citizens. And we've got some pretty aggressive goals on that. So that'll be in the transportation ma mobility plan as well. Um, neighborhood traffic mitigation program is ongoing. We bring those to you as, as needed. We'll probably have a pretty significant outreach piece on Third Avenue this year. Uh, You'll see the meetings that we'll, we're going out to those citizens and that that uh, neighbor those neighbors as well for, for a lot of that. So we'll keep you updated on that. There's always um, other neighborhood traffic mitigation program. We usually try to get those to you as a staff update as we bring those through. And I think we talked about uh, a couple months ago, uh, Gay Street is part of that program, north of 15th. And then uh, I think finally, I think it's the last one on the list is the operating budget and that local bus fare buyout. Um, what we would like to do is come to you usually in quarter number three, but it's going to be probably more like quarter number four at this point. We're just now getting the um, the the actual information from RTD to you know today basically is is um, we've got the package to go in front of city council to continue those free fares for 2023. So that's kind of how long it takes from. Once we talk about it in quarter number three or four to when we actually start implementing it. So with that, um, certainly want to turn it over to you and have you fill in the blanks or take things out as you see fit for the, for the plan. Thank you. Any questions from the board? No, I, I think we can table this and move on to the, um, the EV presentation. Would it be okay to ask for a motion to approve? This is an action item on your agenda. I just want to. Yeah. No. If, absolutely. If, if, if there are no questions, maybe. No, uh, I think that's a good, good segue, Phil. <laughs> yeah, Phil. Um, I'm looking at. Um, the row labeled four other, and then uh, two rows below that. There's a reference to 2022 budget items. Is that intended to be there? No, it's not. It should be 2023. Thank you. Okay. That actually moved to 2024 because we're asking you for the next, the next year. Sorry. Well, I would imagine with that correction, would we like to get a motion to approve? I so move. Uh, Phil, I just want to add. 
I know there's some, well, I can't find the line item now, but um, there's conversation in here about, Hmm. micro movements within the city and and I didn't mean to put you on the spot about RTD it's just that at the November meeting RTD didn't get a chance to respond to the idea that you know there needed to be more bus service in town and so I'm just wondering is there a specific idea of how we will have more transportation within the city so particularly you know as we know on the east side of town there's uh, there's some real gaps there in service. Yeah, yeah board member Chris, I don't know. Um, we didn't get a chance to, we don't, we're not doing a lot of details on this yet because it's very amorphous at this point, but what we're talking about is how do we fill in the gaps that are in the RTD system, the local bus system? So it's exactly um, kind of what you're discussing is how do we do that? <clears throat> And we've looked at some other models around this uh, around the country, and there's a there's a real positive one that we're seeing for we call it micro transit. Uh, it's smaller vans, six person, eight person vans or or smaller buses, but they uh, they're operated by a private company, and so it's contracting with a private company. It's it's very similar to the shelter program we have with Lamar, where we contract with them to put the shelters up. We're, we're the ones who are operating the contract, but they're the ones doing all the work as far as they put the, you know, they build the shelter, or they buy the shelters, they put the shelters up, they do get advertising for them, so that does help offset the costs for them. Um, we need to find out how we would, could offset the costs for the microtransit model, but they, they would provide the drivers, the equipment, the routing, um, but they would be based on on a scope of work that we would put together. So we'd be very specific about what we were, what we were looking for. And uh, we'll have, you know, as, as this develops, we can provide more of that information to the, to the board here. But that's the general model. Uh, and we can send you more information. The, the model we were looking at, there's one example. There's, there's a lot of different examples around the country. It's not just one, but the one we're looking at is called Via Transportation Services. Um, and we can send you more information about that as well. But there's a lot of different groups out there. We're just we're trying to find out if we put a request for proposal out for that kind of service, how much would it cost, and then what kind of level of service would we get? And we're trying to again fill in those gaps and make transit much more desirable, you know, much easier for people to use, mm -hmm. comfortable, reliable, and safe is kind of the way we sell it. Mm -hmm. Can is. Can we add that to the list and have uh, have a a date when we would wish to see some action on that? We do show that under other for um, it's the third to last line under local okay. micro transit model. Oh yes. Um, we can move that up if you like, rather than being Q four, we could move it up. But uh, again, we're not sure where the funding is going to come from at this point. It would have to be most likely grant funded to start, and then we'd have to figure out a sustainable way to fund this over time. Okay, can we make that Q1 through Q4 so that we have an ongoing conversation about it? We could just make it ongoing if you'd like, yeah. Okay. Is that, Yeah. If you, I, I'm not sure if I would uh, ask we're in we a motion right now, so it'd be a friendly amendment. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe what we'll do is we'll, I guess we'll have to pull the motion Discuss this. Phil, I had a quick question. Um, does the microtransit um, kind of go after also the last mile question when we're talking about whether it's, and I'm not saying it's the right choice, electric scooters, electric bikes, th those sorts of items. Is that also kind of wrapped in this microtransit model? Yes. Uh Chair Lehner, the, the idea is, and I'll just kind of give you the, the general vision at this point, is to do a 15-minute a or less wait for a 15-minute or less ride across town. So we think that will be appeal, appealing to most folks to be able to, it's almost an Uber-Lyft type experience, but it's, you'd have to meet, you wouldn't, 
maybe get a pickup right at your front door. You'd have to go to a, a meeting location or a, cross, uh, a set of cross streets where other people would meet you or be there as well. So it's almost like a bus stop situation, but it would be no more than um, a couple blocks from your house or your, or your business or wherever you're trying to get to or from. And we try to extend that, those hours later into the evening too, again, to supplement the local bus service that turns off around eight o'clock in Longmont, so. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry, I <laughs> kind of strayed. Do we have any other questions from the board? Okay, other than the um, <clears throat> changing of the budget year to 2024 on the second to top, or two down on the other category, there's no other questions or need to make any additions? Uh, if we could change for the local microtransit model, um, the Q4 to ongoing. Okay, with um, the change to the um, budget to 2024, as well as, of course, including or changing the local uh, microtransit model to ongoing, are there any other changes or things that we would like to discuss? Okay, can uh, we get a motion to approve? I move that we approve the... Transportation Advisory Board work plan and schedule with the two, two adjustments um, to the 2023 budget line and the local microtransit model line. Seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? So the next, the next item on your agenda is the uh, Regional Electric Vehicle Plan from Lisa Noblock. So, Lisa, yeah. how are you? I'm good. Good. Good evening, members of the Transportation Advisory Board. It's nice to see you all. I haven't been to this board for a while, and I think there's different board members from the last time I was here in a much more formal setting. I'm not, even, not used to being in this room for anything other than council meetings, but I'm Lisa Knobloch. I'm the sustainability manager for the city. I'm housed in a relatively newly created department called strategic integration, but I manage the city's implementation of the sustainability and climate action plans and make sure that the city is staying on track to meeting our uh, pretty ambitious sustainability and climate action goals. So I work with Phil and Jim and Ben and probably just about everybody across the organization at some point or another. So um, I haven't been to you all for quite a long time, uh, but there's been some exciting stuff particularly happening in the electric vehicle space. So I thought I would come give you all a visit and let you know what's going on. Feel free to ask any questions and I'm happy to come back at a, a more regular basis to help keep you all in the loop with things. But what I wanted to chat with you all about tonight is the Regional Transportation Electrification Plan for Boulder County Communities. That's a big name, a mouthful for, the, for that plan. Uh, it was completed in uh, August of last year and we're now in the implementation phase. And I just wanted to bring this to you all to let you all know that, that we've been participating in this plan. We have some significant EV goals that we're trying to achieve, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but to let you know this is happening and, and this is something that we're working on. So I'm gonna run through kind of the, the plan itself and feel free uh, to interject at any point in time if you all have any questions or comments. Uh, so just what is a regional transportation electrification plan? So it's a planning document that helps guide Boulder County communities, and you'll see who all has been participating in this process to really support the large scale transition, uh, equitable transition to zero emission vehicles. So as you all know, transportation is not an issue that is just Longmont that stops at our borders. We have folks that live and work and recreate and travel all across the front range and beyond. And so it really is beneficial for us to address all transportation, but particularly electric vehicles on a regional basis. Whoops, went the wrong way. 
so this really helps uh, address that on a regional scale. It helps maximize our collective ability to design and implement larger scale solutions, uh, leverage funding. So that's a big one right now, especially with all the federal funding dollars um, coming down that supports electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure. And then also to avoid duplication of efforts. So we have folks that are working on these issues across the region and we're doing our best to stay coordinated so that we can collaborate when it makes sense for us to do that. And this plan helps us get all on the same page. Uh, the benefits, uh, which I imagine you all are uh, aware of, so public health, uh, obviously as we transition to electric vehicles, in addition to greening our grid at the same time, there's a lot of public health benefits around particularly air quality in particular, which we all know is a big issue on the front range in particular. It helps reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which also helps support our, our climate action goals. It helps create energy independence and cost stability by reducing the dependence on fossil fuels. And then it saves money over the lifetime of the vehicle. If you all have had the opportunity to, to own or use an electric vehicle, um, the maintenance is a, is a lot uh, cheaper, although there are still upfront barriers in terms of cost to folks and part of this plan goes into that as well. This plan also helps support both state and local efforts to transition the transportation sector uh, to electric. So the state has a plan uh, to reach a specific goal around EVs by 2030. And then also the city uh, in 2020, I think it was, I can't keep track of the year now, uh, passed the Equitable Carbon Free Transportation Roadmap, uh, which we brought to you all. And I don't know how many members are, are still is that all new members from that point in time? Okay, well that might be a conversation for a different night, although I'm happy I have some slides, although they don't go into great detail. I'll make sure you all have the, the link to that plan, but I'll touch on that a little bit later and then I'm happy to answer more questions. But uh, essentially this regional plan helps us support um, our transportation uh, electrification goals as well. There's a number of folks that have been involved in this process. It was largely run through the Excel Energy Partners and Energy Program uh, that was, that's contracted through the Brendel Group, uh, which is a consulting group that does uh, sustainability work. Um, um, a number of Boulder County communities have been participating in this process that are all listed there. I think Netherland is probably one of the only ones that's not represented. The planning process, uh, the plan development started in July of 2020, or June, yeah, July of 2021. Uh, we've been working through this period of time to put the plan together. And then in August of last year, through December of this year is when our contract with partners and energy goes through as far as implementation goes. And then the, the communities will work together to figure out what implementation looks like beyond December 2023. Uh, the vision that we developed through this plan is that Boulder County communities will work with regional partners to implement solutions that support the large scale and equitable transportation to zero emission vehicles. That term equitable is a really important one. We know there's a lot of barriers still for folks accessing electric vehicles, owning electric vehicles, um, and then making sure also within the Boulder County community as well that there's geographic equity in terms of accessing things like charging infrastructure. So the goals we set are a transition of 30% of all vehicles registered in Boulder County to zero emissions by 2030. And that's in line with our GoEV resolution that city council passed last year. And then also by 2030 to install a combined 2,380 public level two charging stations and DC fast charging stations, again, equitably distributed across Boulder County. So that's really focusing on not just the areas that tend to have more money, but how do we as a region really go after some of those funds to support these goals across the Boulder County community. And this number in particular is, is partly what supports that state goal, uh, looking at that distribution across the entire state as well. The planning outcomes, so we have our two goals. We have four focus areas, which I'll get into, uh, three cross-cutting th themes, and then 15 strategies that are really focused on that uh, immediate implementation timeline of 2022 to 2024. These are the four areas that really uh, came out of this process that, again, because we know there are a lot of barriers, we know that there are a lot of components to really make this transition successful, that there's a lot of, a lot of pieces that need to be in place in order for us to meet those goals. 
And all of those strategies fell into these four bucket areas, which are uh, sp supporting community EV adoption. Um, that's really focused more on the, the vehicle side of things. Uh, public charging, so that's, as, as you can imagine, the charging infrastructure side. Home and workplace charging, um, so a little bit separate than like the, the public sector, but focusing on how do we help support folks to have charging either available at their homes or at their workplaces. And then plans, codes, and policies, and that's how do we create some standards around everything from ADA accessibility to design guidelines like setbacks and signage and all that kind of stuff to pricing structure best practices because right now it's a little bit of the the wild west out there so as an EV user an EV owner it's hard to know what to expect from one station to the next Oh, I'll just go back to this really quickly. The ones that I have highlighted, those are the ones that, that we're working on right now within these subgroups. Uh, so in the community EV adoption area, we're working on regional community and dealership outreach. Uh, you may have seen some, some things that came out from the state recently. The state put together an EV outreach campaign and we've been working to leverage those materials that they've been putting out through social media and press releases and whatnot. Um, by reposting and resharing those through our communication channels. For the public charging, uh, we're wrapping up right now a public, uh, a mapping of public charging station locate, locations, as well as a number of different factors that can help us really understand where do we need to focus on in terms of increasing that access to charging infrastructure? What areas of our community, again, across the county, already have charging infrastructure, where clearly doesn't, and then how do we overlay that with different uh, demographic or physical characteristics or things like clusters of multifamily housing where we know it's more difficult for people to access charging. In the home and workplace charging, the focus really is on that multifamily piece because we know that is a big, difficult one, a big difficulty. If folks don't have a garage and they don't have a dedicated place to charge, um, are, are there opportunities to include that in multifamily complexes or how do we put things in close proximity so that people can access that? And then in the plans, codes, and policies, we're working on the ADA accessibility and pricing structure right now. This is a list of all the strategies in each of those um, areas. So you can see the priority strategies for 2022 to 2024, which cover the areas that I just talked about. And then there's also a list of strategies that didn't rise to that uh, near-term implementation for a variety of reasons, but I included that here so that you can see the other things that we know still need to happen and that will be helpful in supporting this transition, but that are a little bit further out. And then similar in the public charging and the plans, codes, and policies. So looking at things that are much more complicated, like vehicle to grid charging, um, creating some more outreach materials and different types of incentives and things like that that are going to require more budget and planning for us than in the next couple of years. So our approach to implementation, so we have uh, quarterly full team meetings. That's with everybody that you saw on that slide earlier, all the different municipalities, um, as well as some other uh, partners like Excel and the, the chambers, the Latino chamber, folks like that that are involved in this process. We have monthly subgroup meetings for each of those um, subgroups. Uh, and then we have um, project management team meetings as well. So. Um, trying to make sure to keep everyone on the same page as we were doing individual subgroup work as well. Partners in Energy is the group that's really managing the project management side side of this to help us keep a, keep it, help keeping us focused um, towards reaching those goals. Again, as I mentioned, the contract with them just goes through the end of this year, and so the individual communities will need to figure out how do we work together beyond that time frame to continue. Uh, th this is just an overlay showing, sorry, I'm not sure what information about purchase orders somehow got dropped in there. Sorry about that. It's multitasking apparently today. Um, so looking at how uh, the regional EV plan also supports community plans. And so we have the higher level vision goals, our focus areas and targets. And then we've also identified in the plan, I don't know if you have all have had a chance to look at it yet. I sent the link to you all. There's regional strategies, so really identifying what are the strategies that make sense for us to work, work collaboratively, collaboratively across the region, and then community best practices, which then the communities can take and implement on a local scale, because those are things that really need to 
um, be adapted for the local community context and those fit within our uh, community plans. And so that's where I'll talk briefly with you all about um, the Equitable Carbon Free Transportation Roadmap. And I'm happy to send you all the link to this plan um, through Phil afterwards. It's a, it's a nice short plan with lots of really wonderful graphics you all can have a look at. Um, but we put this plan together when we are doing our, our greenhouse gas inventory work. Transportation um, is a significant part of our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, next to electricity and natural gas. Uh, we, but it's a, it's a pretty tough nut to crack and particularly because of the regional nature um, of transportation. So we have these goals of reducing um, overall, transmission, or overall emissions by 69% by 2050 and 66% by 2030 and increasing vehicle electrification, reducing single occupancy vehicle miles traveled and improving air quality. Um, but before creating this plan, we really didn't have um, we had a handful of strategies, but not a great sense of how to prioritize those strategies, particularly in the transportation sector. And again, we really wanted to focus on uh, that being an equitable process to make sure that that's not just something that benefits a handful of folks in our community and that we weren't just focusing on electric vehicles because of the, some of those barriers that we talked about around cost and accessibility. And so this is really focusing on the entire transportation system um, that includes electric vehicles. The guiding principles for that plan um, have the, these focus areas of shortening and reducing the number of trips, shifting modes, reducing direct vehicle emissions through um, shifting to electric vehicles, and then also these equity priorities along the bottom around um, making sure that we connect with folks, we're including folks, we're reducing those barriers, and we're focusing on things like safety that we know are really important to everybody. And then this is a, a nice graphic of what's contained in the roadmap. Um, so you can see kind of that starting point down at the bottom. We already have some EV charging stations that are, that are around town that are available to the community, a focus on safety. We have some financial incentives available to folks and then we provide some EV education um, through Longmont Power and Communications. And then looking at that two-year 2023 goal of making sure that we're embedding equity in all the work that we do. And you see that, as I mentioned, in the regional transportation plan, not really coming through. Um, focusing on zero emissions fleet, and we have a lot of work underway in that, in that re regard with our fleet manager doing a lot of that transition. The Go EV resolution, with, which City Council passed um, in 2021. Uh, working on supporting households to be EV ready. And so that, that's through things like code changes, which we did last year, uh, and then transit education as well. And then you see it kind of moves beyond to things that are a little bit more complicated. So continuing to expand EV, expand EV education, looking at things like EV and multimodal incentives, focusing on the workforce development piece, um, and then longer term things like how do we actually support people and things like replace your ride and things that are going to require a lot more budget for us. Um, but this gives you a sense of the things that are encapsulated in the road, the road map, which, as I said, it is not just focused on EVs, but also um, transit accessibility uh, and other multi, multi, multimodal forms, which is a word I can never say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, mostly I just wanted to share that information with you all. Do you all have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to share with me? Thanks for your presentation, Lisa. When I read through the plan, the thing that struck me the strongest was that the plan does not include any goals or strategies related to low carbon public transit operations. Can you explain that? And when I looked at your wonderful graphic of all the partners, there was a partner that seemed to be missing to me that goes by a three letter acronym. <laughs> I'm sure we can't all guess what that acronym is. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the reason that this plan doesn't focus on that um, is because it was this plan was specifically focused on electric vehicles, like low or light duty vehicles. So not necessarily looking at transit and um, other things kind of outside of that. 
that's why I mentioned that when we did the transportation roadmap um, for the city, we did focus beyond just electric vehicles and light duty vehicles. Um, but the plan that the region focused on, they wanted to look at specifically electric vehicles for personal use or things like small fleets like Uber and Lyft and that sort of stuff, not larger scale um, transit electrification. That is work that's happening in, in other spaces. Um, I don't know if, if you're involved in any of that in terms of what RTD's plans are. I haven't heard anything about that for a while. Um, yeah, we weren't working with RTD as much as we were working with VIA um, Mobility Services, which is this, what we call, is, is the Boulder County VIA. And they were going to a, an electric fleet already, so it was good to work with them. And we were kind of on the same page as that were uh, the other folks that we were working with was the St. Frayne Valley School District and their bus systems. And um, at the time, there wasn't a lot of traction there for electric vehicle or electric buses at the time. But I think that's moving in a more positive direction as they're starting to see more about more 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 grant opportunities to help with electric school buses. So uh, there is still work to be done with RTD. Uh, they've converted some of their fleet in downtown Denver, but the more regional pieces aren't uh, on their radar right now, for right now. Was RTD invited to be part of this plan? Uh, they weren't because, again, the focus of this plan was just looking at light-duty electric vehicles. Um, we This is a space, as I mentioned, transportation is a, is a big thorny issue to tackle and we have to kind of take it in pieces and so when when the regional communities came together the the light duty like uh, electric vehicles was the area of priority for folks right now um, i agree that that is a big issue that's an issue that folks like the colorado community for climate action which you are a member of at cc4c it's a statewide lobbying organization that um, lobbies for state legislation to support all things climate action and that that is an area of focus from that group but not for this plan in particular yep. Any questions? Yeah. so Lisa one of your goals is to reduce single occupancy uh, miles traveled so so how do you um, consider that to be played out in the paradigm you're talking about with light use vehicles yeah, so I think I would say that that is really where uh, the other efforts that we work on with um, Phil and Ben and folks in that area where we're really trying to get people out of vehicles altogether, personal vehicles, whether they be electric or um, internal combustion engine vehicles and supporting all of the things, all of the multimodal um, access to transit, biking and walking, active transportation, all of those sorts of things. That's really that focus of, of reducing the single occupancy vehicles or things like carpooling, vanpooling, those types of efforts. Phil, do you want to add anything to that? That's your, your area. Well, just the reality that even if we were to convert the whole fleet, current fleet to electric vehicles today or tomorrow, <laughs> um, we would still have issues of congestion, right? So, and there'd still be safety concerns with that number of vehicles and the and the and just that being on on the road not changing anything. So, it's not just electric vehicle conversion, and it's not just about only air quality. It's also about safety of the citizens, and so that's part of the focus as well. But we also see that the air quality benefits could be if we can make bicycling again safer, more reliable, and more comfortable, as well as transit, all mm -hmm. those three things for transit, people may make a decision to move to those different modes rather than us trying to force people into modes, make it more attractive for people to get onto those modes, and then that will help with our congestion issue as well as helping with our air quality issue. Yeah. Would you say that's 50-50? Uh, so you're saying you don't want everyone to drive an electric vehicle. What you want is to reduce the number of vehicles as well. So that kind of relates to the RTD issue and, mm -hmm. and other modes of transportation. So is it about 50-50, or do you have any idea of how much, how much would have to go to multimodal? Yes, we have goals around that particular number. It is not 50-50. Um, and I don't have those numbers at the top of my head. I want to say it's something like 
increasing 14 percent is what I want to say around I don't I would have to I can definitely get those numbers for you and I'm sorry I didn't come prepared with those in particular but we do have specific goals around increasing mode share and reducing um, single occupancy vehicles so those are those those two things kind of go hand in hand right um, so, so you want to reduce um, single use vehicles by 14 percent or you want people to use um, multimodal transportation, fourteen percent more of the more times. Or? Yeah, I think Phil's trying to trying to pull those up. I mm -hmm. don't have those numbers at the at the tip of my tongue. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, just um, but it's not. Yeah, it's definitely not fifty fifty. The 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 bulk of it is focused on on that that the 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 bulk of the emissions reduction really is focused on that vehicle electrification switch. So getting people to drive electric vehicles instead of internal combustion engine vehicles. And then the emissions also associated with the medium and heavy duty vehicles as well. So buses and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then it is a much smaller percentage in terms of driving that mode share. So getting people to walk and bike and use transit more mm -hmm. and thereby reducing those the single occupancy vehicle. Yeah, and I, I'm just wondering what... what what portion of it do you want people just to not drive at all? You know, and I think some of that also has to do with um, having what people need more accessible to yep. them in yeah. walkable areas. Yeah, so then, so. yeah, that's where it starts to touch into things like land use and all of those sorts of things of how are we developing communities that where people neighborhoods and areas where people have everything that they need within, you know, a 15 or 20 minute walk or bicycle ride. Um, we get into other difficult economic factors like housing affordability and where people can afford to live and where they work and all of those sorts of things. So there's a lot of things that go into that that are that are more difficult, but that are also, when you start to take a step back, part of the bigger picture of the, the different pieces that we're working to put in place that help support all, all of these efforts. Which is a nice segue into one of the other questions I had, which is when you're talking about these charging stations, and um, we're also looking at the planning and development of the town, are you having having trouble finding space for them? Uh, we're not ha having trouble finding space per se. I would say when you start to talk about taking parking spaces mm -hmm. away from other uses, that can be difficult. Uh, we do now have code updates in place around new construction focusing on the residential side. And we're talking about um, code requirements on the commercial side as well that would start to require some level of at least installing conduit, if not full on charging station. So as developments are coming online, those things are built in from the beginning. Um, space is not necessarily an issue. Um, it's sometimes more around uh, electrical capacity at different sites and so that's another component that we have to assess is whether or not a site or multiple sites in one particular area can um, support a lot of uh, incoming electric vehicle charging infrastructure without having to do upgrades to the infrastructure in that particular area. Jim, I don't know if you want to add anything to that um, from the engineering side. Well, that would be an LPC question, but based on the meetings we've had with them on, on uh, some of the meetings that that, that uh, were noted in the presentation, um, one of the challenges will be the electrical infrastructure that goes along with the the added draws to the system. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the, the factors we're looking at when we look at placement, uh, where in the city they have and what uh, infrastructure they have there. So uh, as we plan them out, there's adequate time to, to plan for improvements to the infrastructure. Um, it's just, you know, right now we're just very early in those planning phases. Uh, but one thing I will note is, and the, from the, the development kind of standpoint, um, we see uh, the development, the DRC, what's called DRC, the Development Review Committee, we've seen a number of, of, of applications for uh, charging stations from the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, some of the gas stations in town are, are looking to uh, add charging stations. Um, we're working on a, an application right now over at the Twin Peaks Mall area. They're, even though they already have some charging stations, they're, they're putting in applications to add more. So we're seeing it in, in, on a, in a number of different levels. 
Does that increase in electrical power? Does that add to emissions? Uh, it does and it doesn't, and we have all of the modeling behind that. So part of the important component of, of this, again, kind of taking the step back and what are all the pieces that, that need to be in place in order for us to, to meet those greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, which is in part what's driving this, is that the grid needs to continue to get cleaner um, to support the electricity to power electric vehicles. And we're at about 50% renewable uh, delivered energy currently. Um, at least as of the end of 2021, I haven't seen the data for 2022 yet since we're just now into the new year. And that's a commitment from Platte River and, and the um, city of Longmont as well as the other owner communities to be 100% renewable by 2030. There's modeling that goes into whether or not um, it's clean enough to say that the emissions added from the additional electricity are a, ben a net benefit versus from transitioning away from fossil fuels. So you have to hit a certain threshold of renewables in order for that to be um, true. And we are, we are beyond that because of our energy mix now. Um, so, so yes and, and no, and there's modeling behind that. Um, the other direct benefit that you get regardless is the tailpipe emissions, which are not insignificant from an air quality standpoint. Um, so you are adding electricity, but it's cleaner than the gas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any other? I had a couple questions and yeah. comments. Um, it, it seems with the, the conversation about RTD, it's almost like the tiger by the tail, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're not going to control that, nor is any community and or region. So I, I understand that that's, again, incremental. Mm -hmm. And then the mo mobility by choice you know, it is what I see is more important here is the equitable access yeah. and moving that needle. You know, I, I, I think folks are going to choose their mobility by choice based on a lot of different factors that yep. we just can't have a say so in, right? But I was curious about when you mentioned um, uh, Twin Peaks Mall and talking about the public charging stations and notwithstanding the infrastructure that's needed and all that. Is that viewed as revenue generation for any of the partners that are involved, or is it strictly an amenity? Say if it were a townhouse, apartment house, multifamily structure, that might be more amenity as opposed to revenue generation. I was just curious if partners are involved in this or looking at this as revenue generation. Yeah, when we talk to business partners and things like that, uh, that goes back to part of what one of those subgroups is focusing on in terms of um, best practices around pricing, um, pricing strategies. And part of that is is focused on helping to helping folks to understand how do you price it. So one, you're not out of pocket money un unless it is a driving amenity for some places. A lot of folks are going to need to have some level of, of revenue coming in from those, and and that is the case for the most part. There is, it's not like people are making hand money like hand over fist necessarily, but there is a revenue generation that that happens. Um, there's a maintenance component that can trip people up sometimes if a, if a station goes down and you need to get somebody in to help fix that. And so part of the work of that subgroup is to have all those things in place so that we can support um, business owners and, and private entities to understand what all those things are going in so that that can be a profitable, profitable um, generator for folks. It is becoming more and more of an amenity. Uh, and so we're starting to see people ask for things like that more. Um, so that's you know definitely part of the conversation, but not the driving factor for most people. Great, thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me, the last other two questions, and Jim, you might be able to address this, is LPC. Is there, are they, because I, I don't know how they operate within the city, charter-wise and all that, but mm -hmm. is, is that a partner that's considered a, a, a part of this? Yep. And then the last is AQMD. Are they in, engaged on, on this project as well? I don't recall if I saw AQMD on, on the, um, the list of uh, contributing uh, organizations. So LPC is another division or department within the city. Okay. And so I've been the, the main representative working on this plan, but I work closely with a, a lot of colleagues at LPC, so I've kept them in the loop, and some of them are now participating in the subgroups um, that you saw earlier, um, as well as, as Ben's been participating in one of them as well, so we're really drawing folks from other parts of the organization into that process, so LPC has very much been a part of that, and I am not familiar with AQMD, so I can 
take a stab at what that is, but I'm not familiar familiar with with them as a partner. Basically, air, air quality, quality muni yep. municipal district, and I believe they do because they'll do the they did the lawnmower program with you know replace your um, ice lawn lawnmower with electric. Oh, through rack. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yes, regional air quality, but I thought they go by AQMD. No, maybe it is rack. Air quality control. Thank you. AQC. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There's a lot of acronyms in this particular <laughs> space. It's hard to keep track of them. Um, they haven't been directly involved in this. Um, we, we work closely with a lot of folks from that agency. Um, they are one of the ones that are responsible for some of that, fu that funding that comes down. Although I think some of that is changing, um, as other federal funding comes down, I can't, I can't speak to the details of that. Um, but so, so we've been engaged with them, not necessarily it directly in this project, but they, they're involved in a lot of this work on the regional scale. Um, but they weren't a partner that helped develop the plan. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It was a good presentation, a lot of information. Taylor, do you have anything you want to add? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I was waiting. Yeah. Um, I guess the well, one thing that I'm intrigued by, because in the pamphlet, at least, there wasn't any, like, hard numbers for incentives. And, yep. and you know, obviously for homeowners, upgrading an electric panel is quite expensive. And then adding another amperage for, for public mm -hmm. charging. My, my neighbor actually just did that. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that as well. Um, fingers crossed. But, <laughs> um, so that's one thing is just how incentives will be factored in, especially for income or... Yeah. Yeah, so that that's one of the one of the strategies within here is let's see is figuring out those incentives piece, and so that's really digging into kind of what's already out there, how well are they working, who can access those incentives because there's barriers to accessing a lot of the incentives that are available. A lot of them are things like tax credits and things that you get later, not you know at the time that you probably need them. So that's part of the the research of the implementation side, and then figuring out. That'll be that'll be one that, that that looks at what happens on a regional scale and who manages that and what can happen on a local scale. So we LPC does have a rebate available right now for charging infrastructure for residential customers. I believe it's five hundred dollars to help install a charger. But if you have to deal with other upgrades, that can be very costly. So um, that's other work that we're also looking at in our building electrification work as well of how do, how do we help support people financially in, in the transition. So we'll be getting into that. I don't have any specific numbers associated with that as yet. And then, I mean, the other big piece of that is where does that money come from? Um, there is federal funding now available through the IRA and, and other sources that we're keeping track of. All right. And then a uh, second question is because we didn't talk about e-bikes very much mm -hmm. and we know the rebate for the e-bikes in this city, what went through by a day yes, or something? Yeah. Very fast, yeah. Um, but but then also just, just like a national thing, like obviously through COVID, people started buying them in droves, and then, then now they're actually outselling electric and hybrid cars uh, combined. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just find that super intriguing. But then also I'm reminded of my experience in other countries where they started now the, your last mile delivery is by bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that involves... You know, bigger cities. Like I, I hope we'll get to that point in the, you know, at some point. But uh, but then they also developed a battery swap system. So I don't know if that's another avenue and probably easier to implement. So it could be done faster than mm -hmm. just charging network. But yep. j just an idea. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. You and I are on the same page about that. There's a lot of interesting things happening, different places for sure. Okay. Anything else? Before there were electric vehicles, there were vehicle mile reduction programs that were focused on ride sharing and car mm -hmm. pooling concepts. Yep. I worked for a company quite a while ago that bought a van and that van spent the night in a parking garage near an urban transit center. 
And in the morning, it transported a van load of people from that neighborhood out to the suburban location of the company where we worked. Mm -hmm. And in the afternoon, it, it did the reverse trip. Our ride sharing and carpooling concepts, are they still viable or are they a part of this? I, like I mean, if you, in, if you envision <laughs> that van as being an electric van, mm -hmm. can that sort of thing happen? Or did that all just go away with the pandemic? That's still out there, but I'm going to let Ben jump in on that because that's his area for sure. Good evening, Ben Ortiz Trick. Oh. <laughs> Can you see the other one? Yep, there oh, you great, thanks. <laughs> ben Ortiz, Transportation Planner. So the Denver Regional Council of Governments, they have actually have a, um, a department uh, called Way to Go program, and they actually manage uh, ride-sharing programs, including van pools. Um, I was a former employee there, and I actually started van pool at Dr. Cog, and um, and then that van ran for many many years. Uh, so they have an ongoing presence throughout throughout the Dr. Cog region. So the answer is is yes. Are you asking if they're electric? That's my next question. How many of those vans are electric vehicles? That, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think the answer is none, but I'm uncertain. I would have to uh, get back with them and, and confirm that. I mean, I can add there's, I know Arrival and a couple other companies that are doing electric light mobility um, van you know, for uh, almost last mile delivery and that sort of thing in urban areas. So we're probably maybe two or three years away from a tipping point where we could see rideshare gain more traction in an electronic mode. There are also private companies out there. I believe Enterprise is one that's starting to, to get into that, that van pooling business. Um, they don't have a big presence yet. Great, any other questions from the board? Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, thank you all. Phil, do you have anything else? I do not. We're just on the next item is comments from board members. If I could, I'll start um, to my right here and start with Taylor. Well, that was a nice, short, and sweet meeting. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I do want to plug an event that's on Wednesday that I think Lisa knows about as well. Uh, the lessons from the Bloomberg City Lab Summit 2022 Amsterdam uh, concerning the sustainable city. Uh, Council Chambers, 7 p.m. Uh, this Wednesday. And well, I'll be there, and I think it'll be a very exciting discussion. So, yep. Uh, I just want to uh, thank... Uh, Lisa and all the staff for the information they provided. My questions have been answered and my comments have been previously considered. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim and Phil, uh, for always keeping us on track and Lisa for your presentation. And uh, also Ben, thank you for the maps. Um, I, I have a question for the, um, my fellow board members, and I, I wonder if we could kind of take this grassroots and have a conversation about how to solve our own transportation problems. And we've talked about, um, you know, sometimes I bike down here, sometimes we, uh, members of the board, ride the bus, but often the bus stops running at eight o'clock, and we can't ride the bus, and you know, it gets dark early, and so. I have a long ways to go. I don't always feel safe riding all the way home at night um, after 
after these meetings. And I would just just kind of organically want to talk about, well, how do we solve our transportation problems, uh, you know, with the, what we have available to us. And I just wonder if anybody else is interested in, in that type of discussion. Well, the only comment I can make about that is um, <clears throat> kind of goes back to that prior discussion um, about mo mobility by choice. And I would agree with you that part of that is a uh, personal decision to say, I'd prefer to ride a bike, e-bike, regular bike. I would ride a bike, um, you know, the bus when it's available to us. Um, I do think that micro transit and, and those uh, availability is, is a concern that's going to probably increase as we, as we move farther with the first and main um, uh, development. So I don't have an answer in terms of our discussion doing that, but I think it is something that's, that's relevant that, you know, uh, I, I don't know how, how we can discuss it in this forum, but I do think it's something that we should consider. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, again, I want to thank staff. As always, you guys kind of bring it every time we meet. Um, and Lisa, has a great presentation. We appreciate that. So um, I think with that, we can go ahead. Nope, we have one more. We have items for the upcoming agenda. Yes, um, just going through your new work plan. <laughs> uh, we do have the TMP coming up to talk more about that. Uh, maybe get some ideas from this group on how that should be scoped and what, what kind of wording do we want to put into a proposal that would go out to everyone on that. Uh, but you'll be hearing about that process throughout. So I think that's the first step is to talk a little bit about the scoping language on that. And then the 2024 budgeting items or budget items that are not necessarily capital projects. So. Uh, that's also listed in first quarter. We'll probably have some more things that pop up. I'm guessing the transportation improvement program will have um, four projects for you to talk a little bit more about and understand that they're going up as far as getting evaluated and what the imp what the impacts to the city would be if we got one, two, three, or all four of those projects and kind of which sub-regions we're working with on those. So I'll give you a little bit more information, give the public a little bit more information on those, those items. So that's what we have planned for you in February. Go ahead, David. Yeah, in response to your comment, Diane, um, I'm also interested in personal transportation options available to board members. You may recall there were some meetings earlier this year that went right to 8 o'clock, and I left as if I had been shot out of a cannon. And the reason for that is that the last RTD bus to my neighborhood leaves the transit station at Roosevelt Park at 8 p.m. So I had three minutes to get to 3rd and Main to, to make that bus. So I personally would be very interested in the, the first and main station being more than just an RTD station, and perhaps it might incorporate some of these micro mobility options. Maybe it could be kind of a node for um, Uber and Lyft to get back to um, ride sharing concepts rather than just a mobile phone based uh, taxi service. So, yeah, I'm. I'm interested. Well, Phil, that also um, relates to your uh, question about the TMP. Um, how how deep do you want us to go in terms of ideas for for implementation? Be, because um, just as we're talking about this, I guess I'm more experiential. You know, if if I have to ride the bus and it takes me an hour to get around town, I have a lot more experience as to what would work better or, you know, what particularly works for my neighborhood, that kind of thing. And also gives me a little more information to add to your, your TMP plan. 
So how do you, how deep do you want us to go in our suggestions? Well, initially, I think we'll be asking for your ideas on policy direction. So do we put more dollars into transit, into bike infrastructure, into, I mean, we need to, we need to keep our roads maintained as they are. And that's a big, and Jim will talk more about that when we bring that up uh, as well, but it's, it's going to be talking about how we maintain the existing, existing system as it is with some changes to add bicycle infrastructure when we can or transit infrastructure when we can. But how much does this board, as well as the city council and the citizens, want to you know, move or change priorities? Hmm. So there will be a broader discussion, I think. I don't think it's going to get down to that detail yet until we actually start the transportation mobility plan process and have a consultant on board, then they'll want to get into those details and find out uh, what you are looking for specifically in for transit in the city. And if you talk about more frequency or later hours or earlier hours, that's all going to be things that you know have a trade-off in costs, right? RTD is not going to pay for that. They have a base budget, and they're not probably going to go above that without a lot of pressure. And so is, are we going to put pressure on RTD to do that? Are we going to come up with dollars from our city budget? Does that mean that the roads um, you know, aren't as in good shape as they are today? Tax increase, or tax increases? <laughs> That's a dare from Jim, <laughs> and I did it, so I get. Well, OK, so when we, uh, when we were visiting before we started the meeting, we were talking about um, New Jersey City and a, um, an article that was published about how they had gotten to Vision Zero. And one of the things that stood out for me in that article was they said, you know, all these um, public service meetings um, kind of become a hurdles that you have to go through. But something that worked for them was to to put out barriers, put out you know a pop up circular um, drive throughs, just to see how people responded to them. And then after they had tried them, whether they wanted to see them actually implemented. And so I'm just wondering, um, from your perspective, would you like to be more adventurous that way, you know, try something and see if it's worth pursuing before we put it on the on the plan. Um, have a little, you know, experimentation with it and see what the response is. Well, I think what we do, I mean, you're going to probably hear about this in the newspaper Wednesday morning is the downtown development authority is going to meet with the city council on a pre-meeting. And they're going to be talking about a lot of this tactical urbanism. So how do you do a temporary fix? Or maybe it's paint, or maybe it's something very uh, very inexpensive to start with striping or, or bollards or something that um, extends maybe a curb in certain locations so that we can see if that's working for safety reasons. And I think this is a lot of what you're talking about with Jersey City, where they tried different things that were fairly temporary in nature, saw what worked, and then implemented maybe a more of a capital project, right, where you actually do the rebuild. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, it's not really in our nature to be really experimental without some direction from this board, city council, and the citizens. So we are, uh, we certainly put that out there as here's some ideas that we've seen other localities and other municipalities do. And we'll share those and see if that has some you know, traction in this city. But um, I'm very wary about trying to create any policy from the staff level. And I, I can't do that. So what we do is rely on the boards and commissions and city council and the citizens to direct us into how that happens. And that's through the city manager helps do that too. So there's a lot of different steps, but uh, so we'll put things out there that we hear about. The Jersey City is a great example because they evidently have done, made great strides in Vision Zero this year. So we'll see if that continues. So I'm hearing you say you'd like some ideas from us. OK. Uh, can I make a motion that we have a study session as a group, maybe outside of the board meetings, to come up with some ideas to help, help the staff in their um, transportation mobility plan?
I, I suppose, could we add that to the next agenda to discuss and add, rather than do it impromptu on this one? That way, Patrick would be here as well. Yeah, that's true. We could. Okay, so we'll uh, um, for we'll forward that to the next to the next meeting in February. Okay. Uh, and Phil, uh, I know sometimes the cheapest one is just putting a big boulder in the road. So, <laughs> um, but it, just, just an idea. But I uh, wanted to respond to board member Chris. Um, you know, for me, my, my transportation woes, you know, I'm lucky enough I could walk to downtown. Today I did drive because it was convenient and icy and et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes I try to bike. Well, I try to do that most times. Um, but, uh, but then also it's about convenience and speed and safety for me. It's like if I'm going to the grocery store, I'm probably driving because I need to A, haul the groceries and it'll take me, uh, you know, 45 minutes to get there by bus. And then I got to walk across it in a giant parking lot to then wait for a bus again to then, you know, so it's, it's gets complicated um, compared to other places I have lived. So, but yeah. That would be my response. Should we consider a transportation board ride share or carpool? Okay. Okay, so we've covered the um, items for the upcoming agenda. Are there any other comments from the board? And we can move to an adjournment if I can get a motion. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second it. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned.